the EMS challenge, guys. Start running a few minutes late. It's completely my fault, as always. It's good, wasn't it? Sweet. Um, thanks, Russell. We're in Trustville today. We appreciate your support. Um, we got Dr. Davidson and Dr. Willett uh, lecturing. And if you're in the area at noon, uh, we'll be doing skills lab. We'll have advanced airway. <laughs> we have mega codes. We're going to do some ultrasound as well. Uh, no pig tricks today. No search for airways. That's my fault as well. My apologies. But if you're in the area, come out and see us. Couple updates. For the Brims region, if you're intubating people as a medic, right, on the ones that should be, right, you got to use capnography, guys. You got to document it. And it's got to be in that narrative of your chart. You got to put that you uh, see waveform capnography and write a number. That confirms placement. If I'm reviewing or I'm an attorney reviewing this, that's the best way to avoid anything in the narrative, okay? Wherever you get your end destination of the patient. So if it's a cardiac arrest and you end up calling it in the field, the last thing you document is that the fact that you still got capnography and a waveform and the number. If you get to a hospital with transfer care, the last thing that narrative should be you see waveform capnography and the, the number. If you don't have capnography, you got to realize that too. We cannot have uh, unrecognized esophageal intubations. Nobody survives that. Lots of folks die from cardiac arrest being intubated. I get it. That's life. We all die. But you cannot have an unrecognized esophageal intubation. So catenography is required for all intubations. If you're a medic and you're using an eye gel or a king, you got to have catenography too. Okay. So as an EMT or advanced EMT, if you don't have waveform catenography, I get it. You can't use it for the blind assertion devices. But medics, if you have an advanced airway, document your catenography. Um, and the last thing I'll say before we get started is uh, for the crews that do transfers in a facility, remember when you're transferring patients from hospital A to hospital B, please call hospital B before you get there so we know you're coming. Okay, I know the hospital's already called, um, but if you're transferring a STEMI or a stroke or a trauma to a hospital and we don't get a few minutes heads up, uh, it delays the care of the patient long term. So thank you for smiling. Come out to our lab. Dr. Davidson, it's all you. All right. Wes, is this mic working? We're done. Yeah, I turned it on. OK, um, like Dr. Ferguson said, I'm Blake Davidson. I'm one of the new EMS fellows. Um, I'm originally from Arkansas, did my undergrad in medical school there and then just spent the last three years up in Kentucky for residency. So I'm down here for the next year or so. You guys will see me around and um, unfortunately have to listen to me give give some lectures here and here and about. Today I'm just going to be talking about some kind of over like a big overview on toxicology. There's one thing just sitting up here thinking um, that I know I, I forgot about that I'll add in here in the, here at the end, but this is going to be kind of a uh, kind of a glossing over of a bunch of different categories of um, of toxicology. Each of each of these individual topics could have their own full lecture um, if you want to get down into the the nitty gritty stuff. But kind of my main goal here is just to provide a uh, a big overview of kind of what symptoms to look for um, in order to be able to um, start treatment early and then give a give a decent um, amount of information to the, the in hospital uh, hospital providers. Um, so I don't have any disclo disclosures. Nobody thinks I'm important enough to give me any money. Um, the big goals here for uh, initially is going to be talking about kind of the the big categories. We're going to be talking about sympathetic. Um, cholinergic, anticholinergic, or muscarinic. Um, you'll kind of hear these terms intermixed between each other as muscarinic and anti-muscarinic um, uh, toxidromes. And then some of the initial management of these from SSRIs, which is one that I need to add in at the end, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, opioids, um, uh, cocaine, things of that sort as well. We'll talk about decon, um, kind of when to think about it and uh, when it's important for, for you guys and for the patients um, going forward. And then the other main goal is to kind of help you guys look. I've got some like plants in here, some toxic plants that people uh, will use. It's not so common around here, but especially out in, in, in the West, um, sometimes people will get into some weird stuff um, and see if we can't help, help from that aspect. Um, why in the world do we care about tox so much? Um, it is a huge, um, a huge part of um, medical care, especially now and uh, dealing with opioid e epidemic. And here after COVID, there's been an increase in suicide attempts, um, uh, pretty much uh, uniquely 
and it's becoming much more of a problem. Um, 59% of these exposures in 2018 were patients below the age of 20. Um, so a lot of these, most of those are um, intentional overdoses, um, which we, we need to be able to um, uh, recognize and treat these patients appropriately. The other reason why it's important is because knowing what uh, a patient is dealing with um, can help you uh, be safe as well. So, you know, trying to recognize what, what they're dealing with, if, they're, if you recognize that they're dealing with a organophosphate poisoning or a pesticide poisoning that they may be coded in, um, and knowing for yourself that that's something that you need to be aware of to be able to protect yourself so that you don't ox uh, also accidentally get uh, uh, a toxic ingestion. Um, and then again, early management is key for all of these people as well. When approaching any of these patients, talk about the initial evaluation, and um, it's this is essentially going to be the same for any patient that you come up, right? ABCs is the most important. If they're not breathing, it doesn't matter what they ingested or what they did. That needs to be taken care of first, right? Then we're talking about breathing. Again, whether depending on how they ingest this stuff, sometimes people can, um, if they're snorting cocaine or if they're smoking, they can go into a coughing fit and develop a pneumothorax, right? So you may get a call out for someone who has just smoked some crack and now they're in respiratory distress and you get out there and you're thinking it's all, they're just agitated because they're on, they're on crack, but really, they've got a big pneumothorax uh, that, is, that is causing a lot of their problems. So uh, going through it in, uh, in your standard typical way, and if you evaluate the patient the same way every single time, you're going, you're going to continue to do okay. Um, and then circulation, again, whether they're, you know, if they're in a sympathomimetic uh, or cocaine overdose, they're um, gonna be very hypertensive, or in the opioids, they can get uh, opioids and beta blockers where you get some hypotension involved as well. Then we talk about you know disability, uh, kind of where they're at, where they're at from an agitation standpoint, whether or not you think they need to either be restrained or that needs to be addressed before you can actually go in and get your physical exam, um, and then trying to identify the toxidrome. So a lot of these toxidromes, we talk about our our evaluation, the physical evaluation on these patients. A lot of times you can evaluate what type of toxidrome this patient is going is is experiencing just based on looking at them as a non a non-touch physical exam right whether they're agitated they're flushed they're um they're have a decreased mental status um, or they're not breathing very well all of these things a lot of these things you don't really have to touch the patient to kind of see what is actually going on with them um, so again um uh, just going a little bit more in depth here, we talk about scene safety. So again, on, on a lot of these patients, when we're dealing with, um, say, opioids, if they've got needles, uh, making sure that you know that, you know, where the needles are, um, not poking yourself, wearing appropriate um, gloves. Some of this, some of these, um, some of these drugs that people are using can be transmitted um, dermally. So if you're, if you're caked in them, you're not using the appropriate PPE, you're putting yourself at risk um, of also experiencing some of um, the drug side effects. There was a, whenever, I know when I was a medical student, there was like a big worry about like car fentanyl was going around. It was a, it was a new type of fentanyl that was just called like gray dust or something of, that they were using. And there was a big concern that, you know, people were, um, that pre-hospital providers were, um, uh, going down because of accidental touching of this carfentanil. Um, I don't think it was actually true, but it is just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, that also comes in effect if you're talking about um, gas, gaseous exposure. So if you're talking about you're responding to a call for carbon monoxide or a potential nerve agent, which we'll get into a little bit later, uh, making sure that you have all the appropriate PPE to be able to enter um, that and not experience any, any of those symptoms. Um, the other one is, I see that color doesn't transmit very well. Um, so in a lot of these, you're going to get called out for, um, for the toxic, for the toxic patient, for a patient that just ingested a bunch of stuff. So say whether that's alcohol and a guy's extremely agitated and inebriated, um, and you get out there and I think we all know what a drunk person looks like. And sometimes a picture just doesn't make sense, right? So what you and you, you and when it gets to that and you get to that point, you kind of have to be thinking like, is there a possibility 
of something else going on. I think it's real easy to get pigeonholed and it happens, especially happens on the uh, in the hospital from when I get a patient in and they come in with a chief complaint of, of flank pain and I'm thinking oh, I've got one, you know, one idea going on and then they tell me that their legs numb and then it turns out they have an aortic dissection, right? It's really easy to get kind of pigeonholed into this, this one complaint um, and thinking I'm going out for uh, for an ingestion when it turns out they have something else. This guy that's drunk may have fallen, now he's got a subarachnoid hemorrhage that we also have to manage as well. So kind of also keeping in mind that this is not, you know, not to be too narrow in our approach, right? Again, talking a little bit earlier about the, the guy that smoked crack and had a pneumothorax. Um, I think the other thing to think about also is if we're going to have some of these patients, we may end up having to chemically restrain, right? Whether we're giving ketamine or Versed, um, to be able to get them to the hospital. We also have to manage or you know, document when we're giving these drugs and, and why we're giving them and uh, also notice, note that you're creating a mixed, um, uh, a mixed case here, right? Um, and to be able to manage those side effects as well. Um, so as important as a physical exam is in, in toxicology, the history is probably the most important. Um, it is it is extremely important in um, intentional overdoses, right? Some of the, the at least in my experience, the non-intentional overdoses, the people who did too much heroin or smoke too much crack and are feeling odd, like, they're going to be pretty honest with you. They're going to they're going to tell you, hey, I haven't done fentanyl in you know a month, and I just got back to it, and I think I took too much. After you give them their knocks, and they wake up a little bit. Um, so that those cases sometimes aren't aren't as difficult. The intentional overdoses you generally have to pry a little bit more information out of people and kind of have to do some inferencing on yourself. Um, for you guys, um, the things that I you know that I care about on seeing the most is what's available to the patient. This is especially important in pediatric patients when they're just running around the room and uh, grabbing whatever they can and sticking them in their mouth, and it's and it's they're not able to tell you what they took or when they took it. So getting that history on scene of what medicines are around, is, is there anything on the floor, um, what, what family was in the room, um, and what medications did they have access to. Um, so if, if any of you guys have ever called poison control for any of these symptoms, or for any of these patients, the first thing they're going to ask you is what type of drug was taken, and then they're going to ask you what the dose was, and then they're going to ask you when they took it. Those are like the three most important history questions um, that you can get. And sometimes the answer is a handful of 650 Tylenol maybe two hours ago. And that's okay. Like, just any information is better because that a lot of that stuff really helps us aid our decision or aid our decision making. If someone took, you know, uh, and then oral or uh, route of administration to oral versus IV. Um, you know, if someone took um, four milligram or let's say you know, a, a little bit, of, say 50 micrograms of, I know it's hard to get, of fentanyl an hour ago, and they're still down, and they're still not very responsive, I'm going to be a little bit more cautious in my approach of thinking it's probably not just fentanyl, uh, what we're dealing with here, okay? Um, and then that also, uh, that affects us a lot as far as um, uh, medications and kind of our options for decontamination um, for the patient in, in, in the hospital as well. Uh, paraphernalia on scene um, can be important. You know, what, what uh, if they're, if the patient is not responsive, kind of what you're seeing around, if you're seeing like a crack pipe versus you're seeing needles um, or a bunch of uh, dust from, uh, from drugs um, to be able to give us a little bit more idea of, of, of route. Um, the other thing is nicknames. A lot of times people will use some, some odd street names for drugs. So trying to be a little bit more um, uh, up on what what current people are using in the area and um, what they're what they're calling these names. I remember I had an overdose come in to a hospital out in um, in Kentucky. I was moonlighting and the guy was uh, was coding and the EMS crew came in and they told me that um, the guy had a bunch of ice in his butt whenever they found him. I was like, what in the world? I was like, he was sticking meth because uh, I, I I think ice like I think I was thinking like this guy was overdosed. And it's like, oh, maybe he overdosed on methamphetamines. And then turns out it was actual ice cubes that they stuck up the guy's butt because it's a common thing for when people 
um, overdosed on heroin apparently to try and stick ice in them um, to bring them back. So um, that type of history didn't come to me until, yeah, yeah, I'll, I would err on the side of Narcan, um, but yeah. I didn't know. I, I was like, all right, whatever. I didn't find that out until well after the fact, um, but that was that was unique for sure. So all ancillary information is, is important, um, especially what type of ice you're dealing with. Um, but there are some like pretty fun names when you're talking about when you're talking about drugs. They're pretty inventive. Um, we had a uh, y'all dealt with any did y'all deal with Serenity? We had Serenity when I was like a first. It's like a synthetic cabin, uh, cannabinoid. People were wild on it. Um, it caused a bunch of hallucinations. Spice, it's 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 like a variant of spice. It's similar, um, but people, it, it was like very readily available. What were you saying, Ferg? Saying that y'all hear, I heard heroin, purple heroin. Was that new? I don't know that it was new. But yeah, that's what they said. On the, yeah, it threw me off when they said it, it was a cocktail of three different. Yeah. I've heard of like Tiana Red and some stuff, some weird stuff they're selling over the counter in gas stations that you really don't know what's in it. A lot of this gas station stuff's getting a little, getting a little iffy too. I had a, I actually had a case report that I wrote up about a, um, a kid that did so Delta Eight. I don't know, is that that legal in Alabama? Um, yeah. So yeah, well, it's it was found in like gas stations in Kentucky, um, and this dad had bought you know, a bunch of Delta 8 gummies and the kid took an entire K or an entire bag full of Delta 8 gummies and ended up intubated. Um, so just kind of knowing what's available in your area, what people are calling stuff is super important because they might not even, they don't know the real name for stuff. They're just going to tell you I took a bunch of Molly. Um, and, and to know that that is MDMA and how to how to treat that is, is going to be important. Um, so on your physical exam, we kind of already talked about like a lot of this stuff you can you can get from an overarching view of kind of what the patient looks like without having actually having to touch them. Um, the biggest thing for these is vitals are vital, right? Uh, I had an infectious disease medicine do or a doctor that would tell me this every single day on rounding, um, and I used to get really annoyed. But the more that I do this, the more that I um, uh, appreciate the fact that they really are crucial in actual management. I know sometimes they're kind of hard to assess. But if you tell me that a dude is agitated and just did a bunch of crack and his blood pressure is 240, um, I'm going to probably believe it. You know, sometimes we think like, oh, that's inaccurate. Uh, the guy's got guys all mad. Like, I'm going to know that it's high. But in a lot of these, like trying to figure out exactly what's going on, the vitals are going to really kind of clue us in. And that comes down especially to like temperature. Are they are they um, hypothermic? Are they normothermic? Are their, do their vitals match kind of what they look like? Um, are they are they bradycardic and hypertensive? Like that doesn't really make sense. Um, really trying to figure out what's going on. Then in the other physical exam, some of the things we don't we don't always really think about the people are exam. Do they pinpoint pupils? Are they um, are they dilated? Are they sweating? Um, or are they or are they dry as a bone? Um, and then the other thing, it's kind of hard to hard to assess um, for for you guys um, and even for for me initially in the hospital is urinary uh, incontinence or retention is another big one but if so you've got somebody that's really altered and they're they're, they're confused they're hot um, they're dry and then you look down and their bladder is about to explode um, that kind of makes me uh, kind of leads me down like an anticholinergic uh, toxidrome I think that think that something else is going uh, that that they've ingested some type of um, uh, maybe Jimson weed or something of that sort, and they need to they need a Foley catheter, and that can make them a little bit less agitated. Um, so that that is also uh, really important. And then skin exam that we talked about um, from from a diaphoresis standpoint. The other thing is uh, I talked about envenomation here. So snake bites and other bites kind of fall under the realm of toxicology. So just kind of keep that in mind too. Some some people that can get bit by rattlesnakes. Um, around here can develop DIC and, and alter mental status. Um, yes, don't, or try to kill it, um, or get close to it and take pictures. Taking care of a, of a family duo of a dad that um, 
a kid that was out camping went pee in the middle of the night, got bit by a copperhead, and then dad went out and tried to kill the copperhead, and then he got bit, and both of them ended up admitted to the hospital. Um, odors are important too, um, so we'll we'll talk we'll talk a little bit more about this I think next. But uh, if you get on scene and you smell a smell a really odd odor, um, kind of make make mark of it. Um, that some of them can kind of lead us to what's going on. So I try to get this to where we could guess what's going on, but I'm not smart enough to figure out PowerPoint that well. What's up? Snake bite. Mm -hmm. So what's the current teaching in pre-hospital? <clears throat> what do you need us to do? Regular room management. Okay, mm -hmm. and then just get them to you and watch you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Come yeah. On. It. So um, I mean, there's there's a lot of a lot of studies out there. Initially, I, I was actually in an outdoor store the other day and got really mad because I saw a, a snake bite kit, and the snake bite kit had like a suction cup on it, um, had a tourniquet on it, and literally everything that you do not want. Um, someone doing for a snake bite, right? Really the biggest thing there is I wanna know like where it is. And if you get on scene and they've already got some erythema or they've got some redness on there, the biggest thing that you can do to help me out is get a Sharpie, draw a line around where it's red and write the time on it, All right? Cause the biggest thing that I care about is the spread of the spread of the, um, the inflammation or what, and what's going on from that standpoint. Hey doc, just to clarify, so the reason we don't really care much about taking a picture or capturing the snake or anything like that is they're pretty much in this area all going to be the same yeah that of a snake yeah exactly and and all of america really um all of america unless you live down in florida and you're dealing with some like coral snakes um all of the snake bites all of the and venomous snake bites that we're or venomous snake bites that we're dealing with we treat the exact same so i don't i don't really care what what kind of snake it was what kind of snake it was um so this we're talking about some odors so these are some odors that we can kind of do that we can kind of uh, think about um cyanide toxicity um apparently smells like bitter almonds um some isopropanolol um we'll talk about here in a little bit and acetone so people will have a fruity smell to their breath um garlic is organophosphates and we're uh, talking about like pesticides um so mothballs uh, if it smells like mothballs, um, like your grand, like your old grandma's drawers, um, then you can be thinking about naphthalene. Did that reflect off on your face? Yeah, Sorry, my bad, brother. <laughs> yeah, it's like a. Uh, what's that? Uh, what's it? Oh. So I and I so to speak on speak on the southern, I, you know I. I I knew I was from the southern one or from the south when I I did not realize that it was called a chest of drawers until maybe like two years ago. Uh, to me, it's Chester drawers. Uh, it's just, just how my great grand my mom and Taylor said it growing up is Chester drawers. Um, but whatever, whatever you call the thing you put your clothes in at night. Uh, so naphthalene is found in the nasal decongestants. Um, so it is it's uh, common over the counter and something that something you can see as well. Rotten eggs, your typical uh, hydrogen sulfide, um, and then freshly mowed hay is phosgene, uh, which is found in some other pesticides. It was actually used in uh, World War II as a chemical warfare agent. Uh, so transport um, again. If you're if you're going to chemically restrain somebody that is that is agitated, please just tell me, just document, make sure we're documenting exactly what route uh, route of administration, how much, and, and time, um, because that's the first thing I'm going to ask you. If you tell me that I had to give this patient some um, some versed, I'm going to ask you what time did you give it, um, because I I really I really care about kind of the progression. I'm going to be watching this person over a, a prolonged amount of time. I care about the progression of what they're what they're dealing with. What's up? Hey Doug, so we had a question online that's, that's pertinent to what you're talking about right now with transport decisions, but back to snake bites, which everybody always is fascinated by. I open up a wormhole. Yeah, yeah. the question yeah. is, is UAB still the only hospital or the best hospital to get pro bath or Um, I don't know the answer to that question, uh, to be honest with you. I'm new to the area. So the patient, you can decide where they want to go. UAB does have a dedicated snake bite program. We have a snake bite clinic. We have Toxicology guys that do this, that's what they do. Uh -huh. uh, so I would recommend it. If you're welcome to go anywhere you want to. Yeah, we do the same thing in Kentucky. Anywhere on the market. UEB does have a state like so. At, at an extremely high cost. 
Everything in health care is in the hot dogs. Yes, sir. No. Okay. Hi, okay. Um. The other, the, one of the biggest things here that, that I would say is the biggest, um, two big things for, for you guys for monitoring patients en route is if, if there's any type of respiratory concern, entitled CO2 is important here. And then two is an EKG. If we can run an EKG, that's going to tell me a lot of information. There's actually a whole nother lecture that I could give that's called toxic EKGs. And literally, um, uh, we could just go through a ton of EKGs and name the overdose based on based on that alone. Um, so that is extremely important for uh, for us. Um, and then I've got some of my notes still listed on here, so I need to edit that out. So here, this didn't translate over as well, but this is actually a one of the EKG that I had on shift. Uh, this may need to be somebody in the front row, but can somebody tell me kind of what's going on there in that EKG? Is it fast or slow? Slow, is it narrow or wide complex? Okay. Regular or irregular? Pretty regular, right? If I've got a regular, slow, wide complex rate, um, I'm gonna be thinking that this is some sort of weird junctional or ventricular rhythm. Right. Uh, I know that a wide complex means that the ventricles are driving the main beat of the heart. And I'm kind of thinking of, of a couple different things. But for this one, do I see a P wave before every QRS? So I see a couple, actually. I see these sinus nodes here, 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 but I don't see a QRS after every after every P wave or after every P wave, right? Uh, so there's not a real there's not a real association between the P's and the the P waves and the QRSs, and so what I'm thinking uh, here is that there's some sort of AV block, some sort of heart block here, right? And when there's no association at all, I'm gonna this is complete heart block. So there are a few medications that can cause complete heart block. Being beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, and some other antiarrhythmics, right? And so what they're doing is they're creating a block within that AV node that's not letting the two the two parts of the heart connect uh, and talk to each other. Normally, if I see a rate of around 30 and it's wide complex, my first thought is making sure that this is not complete heart block. Um, and so, what are some things that you know we can think about man how to manage this patient in route, right? So. Pay them. The first thing I want to know is what their vitals are. If their vitals are stable, if their if their vitals are 120, you know their blood pressure is 120 over 80, and they're talking to you, and they've got a heart rate that looks like this, which is what this patient had. She was actually hypertensive, um, 160 over 90. We don't need to pay them. That's just cruel, right? If someone's talking to you. Um, most of the time, I, I would err on the side of not pacing them, uh, but it, definitely putting the pads on them, right? Uh, but it's kind of something to monitor what, what their vitals are, and then we can talk about pacing later. This one, anybody recognize kind of what's what's weird about this one? So this is it's a little fast, so it's kind of hard to tell whether there are P waves or not, but it is it is definitely quick. The biggest thing here that um, that I'm concerned about is this is the QT interval, right? So this one, it looks kind of, it looks kind of, everything kind of looks kind of widened out here, right? I'm gonna say this is a this is a person that um, has a history of depression. You're getting called out for a, a suicide overdose or a, a suicide attempt, and you get the patient's altered. You get the EKG, and this is what you're dealing with. Okay. When I look here, I see a widened QRS, a widened QT. And when I say a widened QT, it should be next. Oh, well, it's not really here, but it, everything's widened out. And so I'm thinking about giving this patient um, magnesium to kind of narrow everything back together and, and, and bring it back together. There. This is uh, TCA overdose can cause like your wide complex um, and wide QT. 
Um, here's another example of a of a prolonged QT specifically there um, is is what I was looking at. So a rough way to be able to do this. It's a little harder to tell the faster that the the faster the rate is. It's harder to tell what your QT interval is. But a rough way is it needs to be less than half the R to R interval. So this is a little bit, you know, drawing out this uh, vector here. It's a little bit longer than your your R to R interval. The QTC that reads out on the EKG machines, you know, a lot of times I tell people don't read the top because it doesn't matter and it's wrong most of the time. The QTC is the only thing that is actually pretty accurate on those things. So you can kind of be aware of those. All right. So uh, we got started a little late. Um, I'll try not to go too much too over. Uh, I, enter, I put in a lot of like history of tox in this because this uh, toxicology is is most of the time the answer is supportive care. Uh, if you call poison control, they're just going to say, keep doing what you're doing and look at them. Um, uh, but so to add in a little bit of a little bit of interesting uh, stuff, we'll talk about a little bit of history of tox. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this guy's name. Uh, back in the ninth century, this is the first time that we actually started talking about uh, the books of poisons. Um, he recommended using a, uh, the treatment of uh, aconite containing dart arrow, which is like a poison arrow that they would use in, in war. Um, treat it with excision followed by cauterization and some onion and salt. Um, and that was a treatment for poison arrow um, attacks back in back in the ninth century. Um, they didn't really experience or talk about how well it worked. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's why I bring a bag of onions to every shift. Keep vampires away and or garlic uh, and and treat arrow dart arrow attacks. Um, and then I thought this was kind of funny. So a lot of the stuff I'm getting from Gold Franks, which is like the toxicology book of yeah, he's the he's the god of toxicology nowadays. Um, but this Abinus dude, the people that were experiencing um, opium overdoses, he described them as they will be dull, lazy, sleepy, without feeling. And he will neither understand nor feel anything. And if he does not receive sucker, he will die. There's no really explanation of what sucker was, but um, I mean, it's pretty accurate uh, to this day. Uh, most people that overdose on opioids are pretty um, lazy feeling. They're pretty sleepy and they don't really do much when you pinch them. Uh, I thought that was pretty accurate even back from uh, 1250. So we'll talk about gases for a second. Um, the earliest note of a uh, gas. Uh, uh, some gas toxicity was back in the eruption of um, uh, Mount Vesuvius, I believe, uh, by Pompeii um, many, many years ago, uh, greater than 2,000 deaths, and no one really knows which, which toxin it was specifically that, that killed all those people. Uh, back in 1929, the Cleveland Clinic had a uh, fire in the radiology department and killed 125 people um, from uh, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, and uh, cyanide poisoning. Um, Large and behold, the, the largest uh, gas killer in America is carbon monoxide. Um, it's especially prevalent um, up in your uh, up in your northern states in the winter whenever people are burning like wood fire stoves. I know in, in Kentucky, it was a huge thing out in eastern Kentucky in the winter. Everybody had a wood burning stove. Um, nobody um, used them appropriately and people come in all the time um, for carbon monoxide poisoning. The other thing is generators. So a lot of people will, um, I took care of an entire family that um, they put a generator in their garage and closed the garage door um, and then all woke up um, with severe headaches, vomiting, a kid couldn't walk straight um, and ended up getting hyperbarics. Um, Agent Orange was, um, he was back in Vietnam and is actually associated with a bunch of cancers nowadays, a bunch of uh, lymphomas. And then um, there are some, some odd toxic um, effects from the people who responded to the World Trade Center that, are, that people are still dealing with. Um, carbon monoxide is one that you guys are going to get called out most on, especially prevalent in, in house fires, one that we need to be aware of. Um, it's odorless and colorless, which makes it hard to detect and kind of hard to think about. One of my uh, buddies the other day, he actually had a bounce back from a patient that came in with a headache, just a regular headache. It was real bad. It was real bad. Got better in the hospital, went home. Two days later, came back with similar symptoms. Now I had some nausea and vomiting. They took a carbon monoxide detector out to her house and she actually had a leak. Um, so it's something that's kind of, it's missed fairly often with people that come in with complaints that you know we're not necessarily thinking of, um, but something to kind of to, to keep in mind when people are coming in with these symptoms. Uh, how it acts is it binds to your hemoglobin a lot with a lot higher affinity than oxygen, and so it is a competitive inhibitor. 
um, and it doesn't allow oxygen to bind to the hemoglobin. People will come in, um, they look, they look kind of normal, just having these vague symptoms, but they're going to be hypoxic. So the treatment that um, that you guys can do is um, a non-rebreather, not just the regular nasal cannula. I want them on a non-rebreather for suspecting carbon monoxide poisoning. I'm going to get as much oxygen as I can. What that does is help decrease the half-life of carbon monoxide and helps eliminate it faster. Um, so the the biggest the the treatment for a carbon monoxide poisoning uh, uh, poisoning is 100% oxygen. Um, and whether that means just continuation of the non-rebreather in the hospital until their symptoms are better, or there are some studies eventually into, into hyperbarics, depending on the level of carbon monoxide um, or their symptoms. And there's also kind of mixed feelings on that. I don't even know, do we have hyperbarics at UAB? Yeah. Okay. Anybody know what one of the biggest uh, physical exam findings you have to look for before you dive somebody? Jordy, specific, really specific question. It's in the H-E-N-T portion of the physical exam. Part of the ears. So you got to look at their tympanic membranes. If they've got like a big like bulging tympanic membrane or they have like an ear infection, you actually have to perforate their um, eardrums. Um, before you dive them, because if you dive them and they have a uh, uh, ear infection, it's going to bust and get all over your equipment. Oh, that's less than ideal. What drug can you carry to kind of help treat some of this? Um, you can. They can carry. I don't know what they're what they're going to be able to have on cyanokit. the cyanokit. Yeah. 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 So those things are pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I think if you're running a fire-based service, you probably ought to have at least one or two doses on a super truck, a battalion chief, or somewhere, uh, and just suck it up. It's about 900 bucks a pop. Is that what it is? Yes, yes, sir. It's about a shelf life of a year. We're, yeah. we're actually having trouble getting actually getting the dose from our pharmacy. Yeah. Uh, but we're trying to carry it um, just for fire response. I think it's good practice. Uh, we did a little study on it a few months ago, finished, um, and the study study showed if it could be cost effective and save lives. If everybody knows you have it and you use it on cardiac arrest cases on the same structure fire. Yeah. So obviously it's too expensive for every EMS agency to have it on every truck, but um, if you're fire based, you know, two units somewhere, maybe worth that 1800 bucks a year. Mm -hmm. Just take care of your own people with nothing else. Just, just food and pot. Um, so next, next one we're going to talk about nerve agent gases. Uh, this one's going to be a lot more rare, but used in like chemical warfare and one that's on every exam when we're talking about kind of some some agents to be thinking of in a mass casualty event. Um, this is talking about like sarin gas, um, and they're also clear and odorless, which is going which is um, uh, difficult to manage. Uh, they act similar to insecticides, so people are going to have um, kind of like an organophosphate type poisoning. Uh, they're going to be cholinergic, which we'll talk, we'll, we'll get into a little bit later, um, where they're going to be bradycardic um, and uh, decon is going to be important here. So if they're, if this is like a, the biggest cases are like in, I think Japan, there was a sarin gas attack and everybody was in the train um, and they had a lot of exposure on their bodies and a lot of EMS uh, people actually were um, treated in the hospital as well because they got it on on top of their body trying to go in and um, uh, assist the patients. Um, the treatment for nerve, gauge, uh, nerve agents is atropine uh, followed by uh, pralidoxamine. So there's actually this, this kit here um, that uh, this is a picture I took last week from Birmingham Fire's drug source. So it's a, it's a kit for specifically for nerve, nerve agents. It's got your atropine dose over here is two milligrams, followed by 600 milligrams of pralidoxamine. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, the doses are still the same. You can draw them up in your normal normal kits, but that is the, uh, that is the drug, drug of choice there. Uh, beta blocker and calcium channel blockers. This is going to be an overdose generally in your older adults. Um, that are on these medications long term, they're going to come out and they're going to be uh, hypotensive and bradycardic. 
when you see those hypotension and bradycardia normally don't go together. Uh, normally, if someone is hypotensive, they should be tachycardic to try and overcome that. So if you see those two in, uh, in, uh, uh, together, then you need to be thinking about beta blockers. Um, I, uh, these patients can be very, very sick, and it is very hard to manage. Um, beta blocker overdoses are one of the scarier things that we, that, that we encounter from a toxicology standpoint because there's not much you can do. A lot of our drugs don't work. You can't reverse them, and they're really hard to get rid of. A lot of them you can't dialyze off. Um, and so management here is, 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 again, mostly supportive. Fluids are going to help. What, what's happening is the beta blocker is decreasing the contractility of the heart. And so you're decreasing, as their heart rate is not elevated, you're not getting as much blood out. So what we're trying to do is increase the total amount of fluid within the system to be able to help assist with some of that, right? So fluids are going to be important. You can attempt atropine, but generally it's not really going to work. Um, and so if these patients got a really slow heart rate, they're beta blocked, your atropine is not going to be able to be affected because those channels that the beta blockers are affecting um, don't allow the atropine to work. So if you've got somebody that comes in bradycardic, you give them atropine and nothing happens, you either think complete heart block or you think beta blocker overdose. Glucagon um, can be used. Um, a lot of, uh, they have a protocol here of like 10 milligrams IM. Um, it's hit or miss. It's not really going to hurt anybody, um, it, but it doesn't really, it may or may not work, I guess is what my case is. If it's on, if it's on the protocol, you're not going to be, I'm not going to uh, harp on anybody not giving it. Um, and a lot of these patients, you're just going to give what you can and see what works. Um, in hospital, I'm going to be using high dose insulin and calcium. Um, that has shown some effect to be able to work. If those don't work, I'm going to go to pressors. Um, uh, epinephrine probably is going to be my first line in this case um, to try and help um, with some inotropy for the heart as well. Um, Pre-hospital, you could even use some like dobutamine to try and help with that. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then I'm talking about ECMO. Um, we actually uh, had a case where we uh, put a lady on ECMO that had a beta blocker overdose and she ended up walking out. And then two months later, did the same thing. Um, um, looking on the dose is pretty high. Nobody's going to have enough of that in your truck to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, one milligram is not going to make a difference. I would be more concerned with you guys supporting the ABC, uh -huh. the fluids, the calcium, push dose, heavy, dopamine, those of that nature, and call them to get orders to give one of the Yeah. Uh, plus, glucagon is hard to get. It's expensive. A lot of places are even carrying it now because of that. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. I'll say the utility of it is low. So if you know if you if you have it, then use it. If not, I would not stress about it. Uh, so we're talking about so a lot of these uh, for the big overall events. Um, I try to get it in for like our vital signs that we're talking about. So the things that I talked about earlier about so important um, is that in ethanol or sedatives such as benzodiazepines or uh, barbiturates, blood pressure typically is going to be decreased. Pulse there in the middle is going to be decreased, respiratory rate as well. Temp can be either or. Um, most of the time, if they're decreased, it's because of environmental exposure. Someone has gotten so drunk or gotten so hyped up on benzos and they've been laying out in the floor all day long uncovered. Um, and so um, that is something to kind of be thinking about as well. Uh, pupil size is just going to be sluggish, not necessarily increased or decreased. Um, they're not really going to be diaphoretic and they're going to be hyporeflexic. Okay. Not going to be able to walk straight. Uh, so they're going to be ataxic. Um, so just for time's sake, we'll kind of go, you know, kind of skip through some of the history standpoint. But um, toxic alcohols can be complex as well. Um, we're talking about ethylene glycol, uh, which is used in a bunch of antifreezes. And you'll see this in a lot of like kids because um, it kind of tastes sweet. There are some, some uh, um, companies that are kind of trying to curtail that out and and put in some um, put in some chemicals that don't make it taste as good. Um, but then other people, some alcoholics, uh, will use uh, will drink rubbing alcohol as a cheap way to be able to get drunk. Um, we is a case in the hospital that I had of somebody came in drunk. They wanted to detox. And they ended up leaving AMA, and on their way out, they went to the Germex um, and just downed an entire or entire bottle of Germex to get drunk again. Um, so, um, you know, people will, people will do anything to, to get their high. Um, methanol poisoning, we think about that when we're talking about like bootleg alcohol. 
Uh, if it's not distilled correctly, then it can have a higher in incidence of, of methanol. Um, anybody know who that guy is down at the bottom? What's that? Yeah, old, old Popcorn Sutton. He's uh, he's a big on um, moonshiners. He's one of the biggest bootleggers in, uh, uh, in Tennessee. Um, so toxic alcohols, um, they're broken down in organic acids. They're created metabolic acidosis. Um, some, uh, uh, anybody know how to tell like from a, from a, if I'm looking at somebody, if I'm looking at somebody from across the room, trying to evaluate them, if I can tell if somebody's acidotic or not, what they'll be doing, just sitting in the bed. You ever see, right. Like those big, like two small breasts that you hear in diabetes. That's, that's not necessarily specific to diabetes, it's specific to acidosis, right? So regardless of what type of uh, acidosis they're experiencing, a metabolic acidosis, they're going to be taking those big, deep breaths. And what are they trying to do there? Compensate. And so they're, how do they do that? What does the big, deep breaths do? Blows off CO2, right? And so CO2 is, uh, is the acid that, that is built up, or bicarb is acid that's or built up, and you're trying, you're trying to get it out there. Um, ethanol can be excreted through the Krebs cycle, so it's excreted out. There are some other drugs that can't really be um, excreted as well when we're talking about uh, isopropanolol. Uh, isopropanolol does not break down. Um, it is broken down into a ketone, so it doesn't form an acidosis. So it's kind of one of those weird ones that is um, you can get uh, toxic without getting this uh, acidosis in here. That's one of the things an in-hospital standpoint that kind of tells us which alcohol they're uh, consuming. Um, clinical presentation, I think we all know kind of what they're what they're dealing with there. The other important part is ethylene glycol can cause hypocalcemia. This is why the EKG is really important. Hypocalcemia can lead to a prolonged QT. So some of the medications that we're dealing with, with their nauseous and wanting to vomit, um, I'm gonna be a little bit more careful on giving the fenugreek, Zofran, things of that sort as well. Okay. Uh, management again, ABCs. It's mostly supportive. We wait until um, wait until they. Um, metabolize all this stuff. Um, anybody know why? Like I've never given from Epazole. Do you know what 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 from is? It's a reversal agent for um, alcohol and benzodiazepines. The risk here um, is that if you've got a chronic alcoholic and you give them from you're going to reverse all the alcohol they have in their system. You're going to send them into acute withdrawal. Um, and so it's not something I would rather someone be drunk in my emergency department for four or five hours than try and give them from epazole um, to get them out earlier because you can send them into acute withdrawal really quickly. Um, no reason not to get it. Okay, so withdrawal from um, eth or from alcohols is also important as well. It's going to be pretty much the exact opposite of everything that we're doing. The big thing here is seizures. Um, and so when we're talking about this, uh, if someone is seizing from um, ethanol withdrawal, we're going to be doing all of our regular seizure management, benzos, 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 but we also need to think about at this point, talk about like the thiamine um, and uh, other drugs from that store. So I spelled muscarinic wrong. So anticholinergics or anti-muscarinic uh, um, overdoses, uh, we'll talk about here in a second. So in these, these patients are going to be um, there's a mnemonic that we'll talk about here in a minute, but these are the, the vital signs that we're going to be dealing with. They're going to be someone that is hypertensive, they're tachycardic, um, they are hot, and they're altered, all right? Their pupil sizes are going to be dilated, and they're, the big important thing here is that they're not going to be sweating. They're going to be dry, okay? The mnemonic for that is blind as a bat, mad as a hatter, uh, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and hot as a desert, all right? And so this is this is one that is like kind of beat into you, but someone is um, is experiencing all these symptoms. It's kind of the fun way to be able to memorize all this stuff. Um, we need to think about anticholinergics. Um, the mat is a hatter portion. I thought it was funny. It's linked to the hat making industry back in the 18th and 19th century. Everybody was uh, making hats and using a lot of mercury, and they would all go mad. It caused a bunch of uh, long term CNS toxicity uh, for these patients. Um, and then they started to have some funky shakes. Oh, the the guy who killed John Wilkes Booth, who is a guy who killed Abraham Lincoln, uh, may have suffered from mercury poisoning. He, uh, he's a weird guy. He was a hatter back in the day. 
He castrated himself with a pair of scissors as a way to curb his libido because he was super religious at this point um, during his madness um, and tried to cure himself from that way and ended up in, uh, in the same asylum. He escaped from that asylum and was never found again. And no one knows where he ended up or when he died. No. Yeah. Um, so these guys, they, they, present, they present wild, right? Um, so antihistamines can cause uh, an anticholinergic effect. Um, so someone overdoses on Benadryl, they may exhibit some of these symptoms. Um, so if you get called out to that and someone has a case full of Benadryl beside them, they may be they may be extremely dry. Sometimes when you when you take these in the uh, late winter um, or early spring, that you kind of you just get all dried out. Like that's the point, right? You're all snotty. You take some Benadryl to try and um, uh, try and dry yourself out, and that's what happens. Um, so this is these are the this is the most common that you're going to see from an anticholinergic standpoint because it is seen over the counter. Um, so something kind of recognized. Um, so our management here, I'm going to get, I need a Q, I need an EKG for evaluation of our QT prolongation. Um, timing is important. If you get, if you get them within the, within an hour, um, we can give charcoal treatment for seizures on these is, is benzos, um, and then supportive for, uh, with fluids otherwise. If they've got a widened QRA, we're talking about like TCA overdose, you can get bicarb here to try and narrow that down. Um, kids can sometimes have some weird like hallucinatory effects as well. Um, from a cholinergic standpoint, it's going to be the exact opposite, right? So this part, the person with the anticholinergic is going to be dry, hot, um, and not sweaty. Cholinergic is going to be someone that is um, got a decreased temp. Their pupils can be plus or minus, but they're going to be the person that's like vomiting, got diarrhea kind of all over the place from that point. They're going to be sweating um, and just going to be super wet is kind of how I think of these patients. Um, this is going to be your organophosphate poisoning. So if you go out to a uh, toxic, uh, someone that's like vomiting profusely, they've been out in a barn all day working on a farm um, and exposed to a bunch of organophosphates, this is uh, what I'm going to be thinking about here. Um, and this is one where you need to be careful about your own exposure, right? So these pesticides are kind of are sprayed out um, commercially, can be all over the place. If you're going out to treat somebody in a barn where they're using all this stuff, be re really aware of what of um, what you're dealing with there, and use appropriate PPE. Um, how the how these work is uh, uh, they're an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, um, which is just getting a little bit down into the nitty gritty. But like what we talked about here is a pinpoint pupils, muscle fasciculation, and then again they're just going to be wet, so they're going to be tearing up, they're going to be diaphoretic, they're going to have diarrhea, they're going to be salivating. Um, and have urinary incontinence. ABC is most important after after decon, making sure that you're safe. EKG again, um, and then if you do have to intubate the patient, they may require a little bit higher peeps. If you have if you got a peep valve, just because they're going to be really wet, right? So you have to overcome some of the fluid that's within their lungs. Um, paralysis with sucks. I know most most uh, pre-hospital uh, places use rock, uh, but sucks can be prolonged. From normal treatment here is going to be based on based on effects. So we're going to be using atropine um, for a patient that's coming in with a, a cholinergic uh, toxicity. And our my main goal here is to control their secretions, right? So I want I don't want them. I want to protect their airway. So if they're uh, salivating so much where they're not able to protect themselves, then I'm going to give them atropine until that dries up. And that's going to be that's going to be your main like treatment goal. You give. Um, you know, your normal dose, one to three, every two to 20 minutes, max of is around six milligrams. Um, all right, opioids, we all know what opioids look like. Uh, those are our vital signs here. Um, the biggest biggest thing here um, is going to be supportive management. I think that what I wanted to kind of drive home here is a dose of Narcan. Um, in the hospital, I'm not giving these whopping doses of, of Narcan. I'm going to give 0.4 milligrams IV, um, and that should be enough to, to get effect. You've, we, I think we've all seen the patient that comes in. They've got an opioid overdose. They get two milligrams of Narcan, and the next thing we know, they're running down the street. Um, I, don't, I don't want that. Uh, I don't think you guys want that in the back of an ambulance where it can create a, uh, create a harm to the patient and you guys. 
So just kind of be be careful there. Um, and then note that the do that the dosing of Narcan um, or that the, the effects of Narcan are generally only about an hour. Um, and so if I'm giving somebody Narcan, I'm going to watch them for an hour and make sure that they're not experiencing um, some rebound effects. If they're using something like methadone um, that has a longer overall half-life that they may get some rebound um, uh, toxicity. Um, some One of the, the scary effects of naloxone that's, that has been described are um, narcone-induced ARDS, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, is if you give a whopping dose, the, the, the thought is it's not, no one really knows why it happens. Some people blame the drug. Some people blame the fact that you give this, this person that's not breathing, so they're not moving their lungs very much. You give them a whopping dose of Narcan, then they take that big deep breath, and they have a sudden hyperexpansion of their lungs, and that floods their lungs. Okay, so it's like a flash pulmonary edema. And so that's kind of the other risk of giving a, a, a monstrous dose um, early on. Um, the other thing about methadone is that it can create a QT prolongation, so kind of be aware of that. It can also experience some um, fentanyl people, uh, people that are taking fentanyl can experience in some serotonin syndromes. Um, withdrawal is gonna be the opposite here. Serotonin toxicity. So serotonin toxicity is gonna look similar to an anticholinergic um, uh, overdose. Um, the, the the biggest thing here is that these people are going to be sweating, um, and so when they're going to be hot, they're going to have an elevated blood pressure, they're going to be agitated, they're going to have dilated pupils, but these people are going to be wet. So remember, in anticholinergic, they're dry as a bone. In serotonin syndrome, these people are going to be sweating. Um, so people that come in in massive overdoses of um, your SSRIs um, can have uh, symptoms similar to this. This serotonin syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion, um, so it's really hard to be able to diagnose unless somebody comes in and tells you, well, they, they took everything that they, uh, that they had. Um, some side effects are seizures. Again, the main support uh, or the main treatment here is uh, supportive care, so benzos as needed. If you get someone really agitated, then give them some benzos and help them calm down. Some pathomimetics are drugs like um, cocaine, methamphetamines. Um, you're going to have a hypertensive tachycardic agitated person that sometimes can have an elevated blood uh, elevated blood pressure or elevated temperature um, again for time's sake we'll we'll skip some of this history um, some of the street drugs here i thought were kind of fun yaba um, and then upper shard and ice um, the so that's what the cocaine leaf looks like. It's a coca plant. Um, it was uh, common down in Columbia. They, used to, they chew on the leaves of this and then um, synthesize it out from there. Um, so here, the treatment for cocaine overdose is, again, supportive benzodiazepines as needed. Um, the, the other thing that we need to be worried about is someone that just did a bunch of cocaine and they're worried about chest pain. Um, and I get an EKG and look for anybody know what what can happen there or what I'm looking for and someone that has chest pain did cocaine. So they can have a pretty significant coronary vasospasm, which uh, clamps down on the coronary arteries um, and develops some myocardial ischemia and essentially have a um, have a pretty significant um, cardiac injury similar to a STEMI. And it looks like a STEMI on an EKG. We kind of have to treat it as such as well, right? So a lot of these, some of these patients will end up getting cath um, uh, just based on based on that alone. We can't rule it out. Um, so this is basically just saying the same thing earlier: is supportive treatment with benzos. Uh, PCP is a uh, one that we don't see very often anymore. I haven't seen it yet, and and my like you know short time of training um, but the other thing the other thing i think about here is it gives people superhuman strength um, so this is the one that you hear about people doing drugs and then like throwing cars around um, so you have to be very careful with these patients um, local anesthetics is is one that um, is generally for pre-hospital providers are going to are going to see in kids and maybe the winter time Whenever cold season has come around, they've got a bunch of they've got sore throats, and they're giving them the topical anesthetics, the sprays. A lot of those have benzocaine in them, and if parents are just peppering benzocaine down the kid's throat for um, uh, for a sore throat, that they may end up with a with a uh, anesthetic toxicity. 
Um, what happens? Those patients will end up, um, they'll end up looking uh, blue, they're cyanotic in their lips. Uh, you'll get to them and they look fine, but they've got a O2 sat of 80%. Um, and um, that's when you kind of need to be thinking about local anesthetics, get that drug history from the family is, what have you been given for this kid that's got a cold? Uh, what that causes is what's called a met, met hemoglobinemia, um, which is basically a uh, competitive inhibition as well from, from the oxygen. Treatment is with methylene blue in the hospital. Um, if they have seizures and you know that they've been getting a bunch of local anesthetics, you're not going to have these in the cart um, but or on the on the truck, but intralipids in the hospital are, are something that we can give and then ECMO as well. Um, so we'll kind of run through these as well. Salicylates, these are another kind of very common, commonly used um, drug that is at risk for uh, toxicity. So aspirin was developed a long, long time ago. It was a lot more common just for pain relief and is now mostly used in cardiac patients. Um, these are ones that are pretty scary to, to have to deal with as well. Um, it causes a bunch of imbalances, mostly based off um, um, the uh, pH. They're going to have a weird mixed respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis, uh, which is more for us in the hospital, uh, but the main thing is going to be respiratory driving these patients. They're going to be breathing 100 times a minute, um, trying to breathe off a lot of this um, acidosis that they're dealing with. And the concern here is intubating a patient with in an aspirin uh, overdose is extremely complex and extremely dangerous. And so if you don't, if you know this person is uh, taking a bunch of aspirin and they are in respiratory distress, Try everything you can not to have to intubate them, um, because there's a lot of a lot of weird vent management when it comes to these patients that probably just not going to be able to do out in the field. And now, at the end of the day, you do what you have to do, and the patient is you give where you can't manage them anymore on on BiPAP or something of that sort. Then you, you got to deal with it, but just know that this patient is very likely to code after you intubate them, and so be prepared uh, to be able to do that as well. Okay. Um, and so well, a lot of these patients, anybody that's hyperventilating a lot, they're going to be volume down, they're bleeding a lot, or they're breathing off a lot of insensible water um, just from just from breathing so much. And so they're going to need some fluids. It's not it's never going to be wrong um, to give them some fluids. What we do in the hospital um, is try and um, try and alkalize their urine. So we're giving them bi we're doing bicarb drips on these patients um, and titrating that basically off a of urine pH, you recheck a urine pH every few hours and you try and make sure that that is um, alkalotic and you try and bind some of those hydrogen ions that are making that patient acidotic and eliminate that out through the urine. Very good. Um, Tylenol overdose is another big one that we're gonna, that we have to worry about. The biggest thing on Tylenol overdose, again, is timing. This is the one that I care about more than anything is, is timing, timing, timing of when they took when they took the drug. I don't really care about, I do care about how much because there is a uh, uh, significant, um, like an absolute overdose amount. But for me, whenever we whenever we use this, I don't think I have this. So there's a, there's what's called the Rumic Matthew curve. And so um, depending on, we got a Tylenol level and really at four hours is the most important for us. If you bring them in in, in two hours, I'm not gonna draw a Tylenol level on them until I get to four hours. But it is it is really important in the treatment and what these patients can actually get um, long term because if they have a if they have a toxic ingestion of acetaminophen, um, I'm going to try everything I can to be able to um, get them knack um, in the in the appropriate uh, time frame. Um, there's four different stages to liver failure within town overdose that we don't have to go through. Um, it's very hard to assess early on. Um, and we kind of we mostly treat off the lab number and just trend trend labs as we as we go. Um, if they're within an hour, we can give charcoal, so that's important as well. Um, so we'll kind of run through these plants. So belladonna um, is a plant that some people will eat. Um, it is an anticholinergic effect. So anybody remember what the anticholinergic is going to be? How to differentiate it from serotonin syndrome? Yeah, so anticholinergic is going to be dry, like the Benadryl overdoses. So they're going to be hot as a hare, mad as a, mad as a hatter, blind as a bat. 
So um, um, that's good. Jimson weed um, is another one that's common. So it is a uh, is a weed that people take for like hallucinatory effects. Um, each of these pods um, contain a very significant amount of atropine and scopolamine, um, and so they're gonna show up as like a cholinergic overdose. Beetle chewing is mostly seen in South America. It's these little beetle nuts um, that people will chew on. It's going to give you a cholinergic overdose. A lot of these people have like terrible teeth um, because the beetle the beetle nuts uh, cause some pretty significant beetle decay. But for some reason, if you're uh, going to a patient that has immigrated in and brought a bunch of beetle nuts with them, um, be aware there. Uh, mostly not seen around here. So digitalis. Um, anybody know what plant this is called? What else do you know for boards? Yeah, foxglove. Um, so digitalis is like the overall gen uh, genus of the, the family of plants. Um, these patients are going to experience a, a digoxin overdose uh, symptomology. Um, so a lot of times in, in dig overdose, so one thing that can kind of get you is that they're going to have a weird a weird color hue to a lot of the stuff that they're um, uh, they're seeing. So if you've got a really old person that's on a bunch of cardiac meds and they're saying, ah, oh, like everything kind of looks a little yellowish to me, be kind of thinking of dig, uh, dig overdose. Um, and you can kind of treat these the same with digifab in the hospital as well. Um, cyanide toxicity, people, for some reason, if people are eating a bunch of the pits, of, of fruits like peaches, apricots, pears. Um, you eat. You have to eat a ton of these, um, which I don't know why people are just pounding peach pits, but uh, if for some reason they do, um, they can experience some um, cyanide toxicity as well. Sorry, it's a little rushed. We got started a little late and I talked too much, but uh, a good reference if you have access to Gold Franks, that is if you want to get into the absolute nitty gritty of, of toxicology. It will get you into everything you want to know and much, much more than even I want to know. Um, and then Life in the Fast Lane has a, is a free access source that um, has some good overall um, uh, management of drugs. Um, I am Dr. Melissa Ouellette. I am, as, along with Blake Davidson, one of the EMS fellows this year at a UAB. Um, since y'all also will have to listen to me talk and see my face for the year, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am originally from Seattle, Washington. Please don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> I did undergrad there. I had a career before medicine and went back. I did work as an EMT for a few years when I back to community college and undergrad on the very long road to medicine. Um, and then I matched here in Alabama for residency where I just completed um, a three-year emergency medicine residency. And here I am. So thank you all for having us. Um, we really appreciate the support and getting to be here with you all today. So welcome to Alabama EMS Challenge, lecture number two of the day. Um, death by PowerPoint is a true diagnosis. So I try to inject a little bit of humor. I try to make this a little interactive. Um, so please, I'll try to ask some questions. If nobody answers, I'll make it pretty painless and I'll, I won't make you wait too long before I offer up an answer. Um, and today what we're gonna be talking about is behavioral or psychiatric emergencies. Uh, so here is a definition. Um, EMS definition is an acute change in conduct that results in a behavior that is intolerable. Intolerable to the patient, to their family, to society. Naked people running down the street with machetes. Society's pretty intolerant to that. Um, and then here's kind of a little outline about what we're going to talk about today. So evaluation, initial evaluation, assessment, appropriate treatment. We're going to talk a little bit about verbal de-escalation. Um, which should be attempted, at least attempted. It will not always work, but um, some of us are better at this than others naturally, but these are real skills that can be learned and applied in appropriate situations. Um, and then we'll talk about a few common scenarios, the suicidal patient, the agitated and violent patient. Um, we will briefly talk about um, agitated delirium. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about capacity, what that means, how important that is for y'all to be able to accurately determine in the field, which can be challenging. Um, we'll talk very briefly about protocols, and if we have time, we'll go over a couple cases. So um, evaluation, right? Of course, always BSI, scene safety, every time, every time. Um, these 
situations are unique, right? And every single one of them is unique. Every patient is unique. So the standard approach is often inadequate, right? You should always anticipate potential dangers. These patients are often um, very unpredictable. It's very hard to tell kind of what's going on in their mind. And um, so always anticipate um, potential dangers. This can be due to location, you know, your um, agitated, acutely psychotic patient running down a busy intersection, right? Standing on the ledge of a bridge, those are dangerous, right? And and sometimes where you have to go to get them, you know, abandoned houses, things like that can be very dangerous. Um, the patient and other people on scene, right? Especially if you have to go into a home, right? Is this where there's a lot of drug use? So just kind of be aware of that, of your surroundings, the situation. Um, and then weapons sharps, right? Sometimes these folks have strange and sharp and dangerous objects hidden in strange locations, right? So just always be aware of that. Um, if your scene is not safe, if you are worried, your safety is paramount. Just back up, take a minute, call law enforcement. Um, if it's a behavioral emergency, often they're already on scene um, to help you, but just please, please be careful. Um, and then um, patients with psychiatric illness, right? There, there's a lot of stigma attached to this. They're not the easiest patients. They can be frustrating, they can be mean, um, but also they can have other disease processes going on. You know, we hear, oh, behavioral emergency, psych emergency, but can your schizophrenic patient also have CHF? Absolutely, right? Can your bipolar patient also have asthma? Yes, right? Um, can your, you know, alcoholic patient have also fallen today and have a traumatic brain injury? Absolutely. So. It's important to not kind of put blinders on and think we are dealing with an isolated psychiatric illness today, right? Keep it open, keep it broad um, when you see them. So assessment, diagnostic accuracy can be challenging here. And even in the emergency department, I'm not, I don't get so hung up on like, oh, this is schizophrenia. This schizophrenia, this bipolar disorder, this is substance abuse, you know, psychosis. It's really, that's kind of irrelevant, right? We're, we care more about the broad picture, right? Is this patient acutely suicidal? Is this patient um, acutely, you know, agitated, homicidal, dangerous, right? Are they manic? Are they going 10,000 miles an hour? Do they look intoxicated? Um, so it's really um, symptom, clinical symptom patterns, not specific diagnoses that we care about so much in these scenarios. Um, so you need to very quickly determine if there is some other underlying medical issue happening, right? Um, you know, this patient, you know, no psychiatric history. Oh, they got some peri, you know, oral, you know, cyanosis going on. Maybe they're hypoxic. Maybe that's the issue, right? Signs of external trauma. Have they fallen? You know, so there's a lot of other things that could be causing this abnormal behavior. And you have to very quickly make sure that that's not what's going on. Um, medical alert jewelry can um, tip you off. Any focal neurologic deficit can tip you off. Abnormal vital signs you should particularly pay attention to. Um, and then just like in Dr. Davidson's lecture, collateral information can be important, right? So, you know, you show up, the patient's obtunded or they're acting crazy, they're not gonna be able to tell you anything. You know, family on scene, oh yeah, I found this weird, you know, these drugs in their room or, um, oh, you know, they've been crying a lot lately and, um, you know, these are the medications that they take, you know? Um, so getting information from bystanders, from family can be helpful in these situations. Um, okay, so, Briefly, we're just going to touch on non-psychiatric causes of altered mental status and behavioral issues, right? And I only bring this up and I'm kind of hammering this home because there's so many. There's so many. So low-hanging fruit, can you guys just like kick out some ideas of like what are some reasons that are not psychiatric issues that make people act altered? A big one. All these patients need a blood sugar, right? They always need their blood sugar checked. Awesome. What else? We kind of talked about one a minute ago. I mentioned it already. Hypoxia, awesome. Anything else? Head injury, absolutely. Right, there's a ton. So, um, excellent job. We'll just kind of, and I mean, this is not an exhaustive list. Look, I mean, it's it's large, right? So, always. Oh man, doesn't quite fit. But okay, click, 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 click. So there's so many, so many, so many. Right. So be aware. Um, so initial uh, initial evaluation um, should always include not just a psychiatric assessment, but a medical assessment, right? These are the minimums, right? Bare, bare minimums. I would love a full set of vitals. You absolutely need to check a blood sugar and you do a quick neurologic exam. Sometimes the patient is not gonna comply, right? They're not gonna hold their arms out for you like this, but just grossly, are they moving everything? Are they dragging a leg, right? Those things matter. Um, so EKG, always nice to have, right? Additional, but this is a bare minimum of what we would like to see. Um, 
verbal de-escalation, okay? Some people are great at this. Psych whispers, right? We all know who they are. They can develop rapport very quickly with people. Um, and sometimes this population, they're very lucky. Not all of us have that amount of patience, right? Um, some of us really just don't like dealing with psych patients, and that's understandable. They tend to use up a lot of resources. They can be mean um, and violent, but um, these are a set of skills, mannerisms that can be learned. You can get better with practice, and they can truly make a difference in outcomes, right? To take away someone's rights against their will, right, to put restraints, chemical or physical, on a patient, which we will talk about, is not a small thing. Um, Y'all have power, right? In these situations, you guys have power. You can do that. You can force someone into the back of your rescue, put restraints on them, sedate them, take them to the hospital. That's a scary thing. That's a big deal. An appropriate weight should be placed on making that decision, okay? And before that decision is made, you owe it to your patient because you are their medical provider to try to verbally talk them down. Is it always gonna work? Absolutely not, right? But I hope you will feel better. You'll feel good about yourself knowing that you tried, okay? Um, slow down, right? And that's something I'm not good at. If I'm talking too fast, y'all just let me know, right? I am a northerner, like I'm, I talk quick, I move quick. Um, so I have to, when I encounter patients like this, you know, I have to kind of check in with myself and I just slow my speech down. It's just slow down, right? explain what I'm doing. I go, you know, just the, the most basic, 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 not to say like I'm talking to a kid, but just just slow everything down, back up, take your time. Um, so I really like this slide, not because it's funny, because it's like yelling at a dude, but um, 10 principles of verbal de-escalation. So can you guys see this okay? Probably not, so I'll just kind of glaze over it. So personal space, right? They say two arm lengths, you don't want to get super close to someone super quickly if they're upset. Um, you want to be in control. You want to be measured, right? You want to be calm, be concise. Don't be confusing in the things you're saying. Don't ask multiple questions very quickly. You want to listen and show the person that you're listening, okay? Identify what they want, how they're feeling. You can agree or agree to disagree, okay? You don't have to go along with everything you're saying. We'll talk a little bit of how to do that without feeding into delusions. Don't agree that there's like a crazy grandfather with a knife, right? I don't see that, but I believe you see that, right? Um, set clear limits, you know? Unfortunately, we are worried about you. You are going to have to come with us, okay? There is no way that that's not gonna happen, right? But just be calm, be respectful. Um, offer some choices within the limits of what you know you legally, your legal responsibilities are. Um, and then I like this one because afterward review, right? Just kind of like, what happened today? What did we do good? What did we do badly? What can we do better? Um, you know, constant, constant improvement, right? That's something that we harp on in my training. We can always get better, can always get better. Um, and then body language, right? We say so much without our words, okay? So if I come in and I'm like this, and I have a nasty, you know, I'm talking to my husband, I got this mean look on my face and I'm like this, right? That's, that says things, okay? Um, but my fists aren't bald, my hands are open, my hands are relaxed, or they're side of a neutral facial expression. My voice is calm, I'm controlled in what I'm saying, I'm not reacting, I'm not overreacting to what they're doing. You're communicating a lot of things. You're making them hopefully feel more comfortable, right? Because the goal is to get them to trust you, to align with them, okay? Um, so de-escalate your yourself first, okay? Oops, hold on. That is not de-escalation, <laughs> right? And that, sometimes that's what we want to do, but that's not de-escalation, okay? So just take a breath. Acknowledge if this patient is frustrating you, making you angry. No, you know, just check in with yourself, right? Because then you can be like, okay, remember, it's not about you. This person is having a bad day all on their own. You're there to help them. Just take a step back. So at calm, even if you're faking it, and again, we kind of talked about these things, minimal gestures, neutral facial expression, relaxed posture. Um, how you choose to react makes a big difference. This really does matter, okay? Um, causes of escalation, right? Um, if you engage in a power struggle, like there's really no point, right? There's really no point because often these people are not rational. Um, so don't engage in that way. You know, not attending to body language, overreacting to their threats or posturing, um, you know, not making the patient feel heard, pushing and becoming provocative. 
I am very guilty of, I'm a very reactive human. Um, and I would be lying if I said there were not patients in the emergency department that I didn't um, get frustrated with and like say, you know, just get irritated with them. I didn't help the situation, right? Those patients inevitably got chemically and physically sedated because I didn't do this. I got frustrated and I acted, you know, not exactly as I should. We're all human at the end of the day, right? Um, empathetic listening, this is an actual skill, right? So looking at someone, you know, I'm giving you my full attention. I'm listening. I'm showing you I'm listening. I often will repeat back. So what I think I hear you saying is X, Y, or Z. Is that correct, right? This is what I hear that you're worried about, you're upset about, right? Showing them you're really listening. And then don't feed into their delusions, right? I'm not going to be like, yeah, I see that too. Well, it's scary. Don't do that. But, and this is something I used to struggle with at first a lot. It's like, well, how do I, I don't want to say no to them. I don't want to make them think I don't believe them. So this is just what I say is I don't see that. I don't hear what you're talking about, but I believe that you do. And if I heard that, that would freak me out. That would scare me too. Like some evil demon telling me to kill my cat, like that would upset me. That is an upsetting thing. So that's the way you can validate them, um, gain their trust, okay? Um, does this always work? Absolutely not. Um, but you have some other tricks in your toolkit should you need them, okay? So physical restraints. Um, there are certain long-term negative effects of this, right? These can be dangerous. Takedowns are dangerous, right? And not just for the patient, but y'all get hurt when these things happen if they're not done correctly, okay? Um, and then there's long-term negative effects for the patient as well. I mean, it's, it's traumatic. This is a traumatic experience for people. Um, sometimes the things we do in our everyday practice, it's just work. This is a day on the job. This is like the worst day of someone's life, right? And so we need to think about that. Um, and doing things like this can erode a patient's overall trust in the healthcare system. It can. So just be mindful of these things. If you have to do it, do it, right? You, you have to sometimes, but just know that it is a, it's a big decision, okay? Um, so the restraint team, this is ideally five people, okay? Um, sometimes you have to do it with less, ideally not, but it's one person for every extremity and one person for the head and neck area. Um, the person who has the most rapport, the, who is the negotiator, they should be the team leader in this situation, okay? Um, these are very high risk situations. Police are your friend. They um, are very good at takedowns, right? They do that a lot, um, but they are not the lead here. You are the medical provider, right? You are the one who's kind of negotiating the situation and should be working with them, okay? Um, they are not medical providers. They're awesome, but they are not, they are not um, the medical provider here, the responsible party. All right, so ideally, and we can talk about an appropriate takedown um, later if you guys want, like the, the steps to do it, the safest, but ideally, once you have control of someone, they have to be supine on a stretcher. There's no hog tying. There is no transferring anyone prone. Those are dangerous. It's dangerous. People have died doing that, okay? Um, so supine, lateral recumbent, if you're worried about aspiration, if they're vomiting, right, if they're overly sedated. Um, ideally, one hand down, one arm above them. And that's because if I have two hands down, I can generate a lot of force. If I have one hand up and one hand down, I cannot generate as much force in one direction, okay? It's for safety. Um, once someone is restrained physically or chemically, they are never to be left unattended, right? That's how we have bad outcomes. Um, and then once they're restrained, search clothing for dangerous objects, okay? They have things hidden in all kinds of places. Um, ideally, this would be done with law enforcement, right? Um, and then once they are on, they do not come off. And I don't think I have to tell any of y'all this. There is no negotiating. It took a long time to get them to that place. You take them to the receiving hospital or wherever you're headed before those come off. Um, and then it's almost cruel, in my opinion, to physically restrain someone and not offer some chemical sedation. Some people, like, you restrain them and they're like, okay, they're, they're chilling. But that's rare, right? Sometimes it can make them more agitated because now they've just had this physical, you know, takedown. It's, it's traumatic. So I would argue you need to at least consider chemical restraint if you're physically restraining someone. Okay, chemical restraints. Um, sometimes patients will accept medicine. Um, uh, in the right patient, in the right scenario, if you feel comfortable, offer, right? You think you're, it's going to be hard to get them in, offer. I'm sometimes surprised in the hospital where I'm like, oh, this is going to go badly. And then I'm like, hey, I've got this medicine. It'll make you feel, it'll calm you down. It can do these things. What do you think? Sometimes patients are like, all right. You're like, wow, 
that I'm glad I asked, right? That is a lot easier to do than going down the, you know, takedown route. So in the right scenario, it never hurts to ask. If they don't take it, then you're, you're in the same scenario you were two seconds ago. Um, often you need physical restraints in conjunction. Um, and an ideal pre-hospital medication for chemical sedation does hits these things, right? Multiple routes. You can give it IM, you can give it, you know, IV, IN, and intranasally sometimes great. Um, have a rapid onset and a short half-life. You need these things to work quickly, and you, ideally you'd like them to start at least wearing off by the time you get to where you're like your destination, receiving hospital. So then whoever's going to next assess them, they kind of see them how they were before you um, sedated. Um, cause limited CNS and respiratory depression and have minimal side effects. No drug is perfect, but we've got some good ones, right? All right, so first one, benzos. Um, I love benzos, not personally, but I like to give them. Um, they are still considered to me first line when managing agitation of an unclear etiology. Um, so Versed, Ativan, Valium, these are all ones that are in your medics kit. You guys may not have all of them. I think Bedazolam is the one that's preferred. Um, you can give it IM, you can give it um, intranasally, you can give it IV, and these are a toxicologist's best friends. So Dr. Davidson mentioned benzos a lot during his lecture just a second ago, and that's because they work so well um, for a lot of the talk stuff, right? Um, so alcohol and benzo withdrawal seizures, right? Benzos, right? Many medication overdoses, benzos. Um, excited delirium, I mean, other things work great for that too, but benzos, you know? Um, so the side effects, as you all know, are excessive sedation and respiratory depression. So you, you got to monitor the airway, right? We got to make sure they're still breathing. Um, these are just some doses. I'm someone who kind of tends to go less is sometimes more. You can always give another dose, right? Um, but I also fully acknowledge that I work most of my shifts in the emergency department where I am better resourced. I have more staff. It is a safer place. Sometimes you guys have one shot, right? So you got to make it count. And I, I acknowledge that, okay? Um, but even if you give like start with four or five, you know, I am versed, you're going to get somewhere with that. And then you'll have a little bit, ideally, you'd have a little bit more time if you need to give a little bit more, a little bit more, get that IV, you know? Um, and you can get them in that sweet spot. It's easier um, instead of just slugging them and now they need an airway. All right, um, antipsychotics. So Haldol is what y'all have. Um, first generation antipsychotic. Um, it's a D2 receptor antagonist. Um, you can give IV. It is not FDA approved for IV. Um, there's been some studies that show it doesn't really prolong QT that much more. Um, but I, I give it IM. That's how I give it. Um, and I just give five milligrams. You can give 10 if they're a huge person um, or five doesn't do it. Um, so the side effects here are extrapyramidal symptoms, right? The kind of akesthesia, tardive dyskinesia, those kind of weird um, physical kind of symptoms. And Benadryl is what y'all have that will treat that, okay? Um, or also um, cogentin will treat it as well. Um, so QT prolongation is the kind of the big thing we worried about. And then, um, so these patients, if, if you're worried, you can get an EKG, I'll tell you. Um, and then do not use in patients with Parkinson's disease, right? And that is because um, they their disease, they already don't have enough dopamine in their brain in certain spots, right? So if you give something that is a dopamine antagonist, right, it's going to further decrease the dopamine that is available to their brain, and you can actually worsen, acutely precipitate um, uh, psychosis, or you'll make their motor symptoms a lot worse. So just know if a patient has Parkinson's, they do not get this drug, okay? Uh, ketamine. Everybody likes ketamine. Um, <laughs> so we, it, it's actually made a big difference for y'all, I feel like. And it's, it is something that we use a lot in the hospital too. We all love it. So very rapid onset, short duration, little respiratory depression, right? You can certainly get respiratory depression with it. Also laryngospasm, um, those are associated with higher doses and very pat like rapid IV pushes, okay? So you're more likely to get that if you um, do it that way. Um, you are using ideal body weight um, to dose that. So that's what we see the biggest issue is there's a huge person. They just go like, oh, that person's probably like, what, 180 kilos? <laughs> and then they get a whopping dose of ketamine, right? Um, so just please know to do ideal body weight. Um, do not use in patients with schizophrenia. That is a contraindication. That's hard, right? Because 
a lot of these patients are agitated and that's why we're giving this. How do you know if they have schizophrenia or not? So I just say, be careful, okay? Um, that will worsen psychosis for these folks and their lives are already quite difficult. So <laughs> let's not do that to them. Um, and then we kind of talked about side effect, emergence reaction. Some people pre-treat with benzos. I do not, some people always do. That's kind of a style point, personal preference thing, okay? Okay, questions up till this point? I know I'm kind of moving quick, okay. So the suicidal patient. So we're gonna do suicidal patient and then agitated violent patient because these are people you guys meet on the daily. Um, suicidal patient. So suicidal ideation is a spectrum, right? Passive, active. Then we start talking about gestures and then actual like true attempts. So passive just means I feel sad and I think about ending my life. I think about hurting myself, right? The world would be better off without me in it, but I do not have a plan, okay? That's passive SI. Active SI is I have all that, but I've got a plan. I've thought about it. Maybe I bought a rope. Maybe I've driven by the bridge. I'm starting to rehearse things, okay? Um, a suicidal gesture is somebody who takes steps to hurt themselves, but how they did it probably won't kill them, right? So someone who cuts their wrist, but not too deep and immediately calls 911, right? That is concerning. That is more concerning than active SI, right? But people kind of sometimes call this a cry for help. Um, but it's more of a gesture, right? Than somebody who gets a gun and shoots themselves in the head and doesn't, you know, does not call 911 first, right? That's a true attempt. So you can see the statistics. Um, this is a big problem in our country. Um, it is, you know, a lot, you know, young people and then older folks got a bimodal age distribution. And so my, um, you know, my advice would be to take these suicide threats seriously. You know, a lot of these patients, um, you know, people who actually have true suicide attempts, they have kind of looked back and saw that these people have an increased engagement with healthcare within 30 days prior to their attempt, right? Um, because they are struggling, they are suffering, right? And so maybe you've run on this person, you know, this woman, you know, three times this month, and you're like, ugh, you're not really gonna do it. Take it seriously. Just, just take it seriously. I don't want any of you to be, you know, to get, you know, to hear that you didn't take it seriously, you left them at home and then they had a bad outcome and then that weighs on your conscience, right? I don't want that to happen to any of you guys. Um, so the suicidal patient, right? Um, hopefully y'all can see this, but this is just risk factors, okay? So um, if they have a detailed violent plan, if they have a history of attempts, they have any kind of underlying psychi um, psychiatric diagnoses, chronic or terminal medical conditions, so terminal cancer, right, HIV, um, they're at a higher risk, right, because the because of their quality of life, right, and what they're facing. Um, substance abuse, absolutely. Um, social history, right, I got a, my wife, my wife left me a month ago, I lost my job, you know, um, I haven't seen my kids, you know, those, those things matter. Um, and then like family history of psychiatric or suicide attempts, um, sex, so men have a higher risk of successful attempts. Women, um, you will see more suicidal gestures, um, but men being of male sex is of the real higher risk. And then age, right? This is bimodal, so teens, young adults, and then older people. Um, okay, when encountering the suicidal patient, be kind, right? Be nice, but you also have to be direct. You need to feel confident that they are answering your questions satisfactorily so you can determine whether they have capacity, whether they need to be taken in, okay? Against their will or with their, you know, compliance. Um, so I, I directly ask, like, are you gonna hurt yourself? Have you thought about it? How are you gonna do it? Those are hard questions to ask people sometimes. We feel uncomfortable, they're not fun conversations, but they need to be asked, right? This is, this is your responsibility as their medical providers, right? This does not put the idea in their head. So some people have suggested that, you know, these severely depressed people, the thought never occurred to them, and then you ask about it, and then that's the seed that got planted. That's not true. That is not true. You need to have these conversations, okay? Um, these people, they may like be compliant. They may say, yep, I'll go with you. I'm worried too. Let's get in the, let's get in the rescue. Um, you know, go, oh, well, I'll just sit, you know, I can just sit in here. No, these, pe these people are dangerous, potentially dangerous themselves to you. They need to be on the stretcher. They need to be buckled in. They do not get to sit up front. They do not get to sit, you know, by an exit door, right? Dangerous things have happened. Their, their belongings need to be searched, right? Ideally by law enforcement. Um, and if not, then they don't get to hold their stuff in the rescue. 
right? Has it happened that everyone thought we, you know, it was going well and then someone pulls a gun out and shoots themselves in the rescue? Yeah, that has happened, okay? Don't let that happen to you. Um, so if well, we talked about that, okay. And then in Alabama, um, suicidal patients may be involuntarily transported against their will, right? You have the right to take their rights away if you feel that they are a danger to themselves, okay? Um, you can do that. All right, the agitated and violent patient. Okay, unfortunately, y'all meet a lot of these people, right? <laughs> On a daily basis. Um, you know, always, you know, consider the potential for violence. Maybe they're just agitated, they're, you know, they're yelling, they're doing that, but they're, they're unpredictable. And at any moment, you know, they can become explosive. Um, if they have a history of underlying psychiatric disorder, they, you should consider them at a higher risk. Never let them stand between you and the exit of a room, okay? Um, and then law enforcement is, of course, your friend. Um, and then just anytime, and this, you know, this shouldn't have necessarily gone here. It should have gone against, um, you know, kind of when we talk about capacity and then more in a, um, like assessment and treatment. But please do document that I restrained this patient. I transported the patient because I think that they represent a danger to themselves. Like, why are you taking their rights away? Why are we doing these things? Why are we giving these medications? All these interventions are potentially dangerous. So to protect yourself from a medical legal standpoint, you need to be documenting why you're doing this, okay? Okay, excited delirium. This is a syndrome. Oh, well, we got a question? Yeah. Okay. So we got a couple of questions oh. came in online okay. uh, that, that are what you're addressing now. And one is, uh, we recently had a case of attempted suicide by hanging that failed almost immediately. Law enforcement advised us that they would not assist to force the patient as the patient was initially refusing then we know what section of Alabama code that we can reference as preventing us under the law for transport. And I'm going to say we probably don't have that with us. Right I do not know that off the top of my head, but if you know who that person is, I can, I will find it and I will get that information to them. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Um, but I will say you guys are the medical providers. I, we appreciate, we respect law enforcement. We are grateful for their presence, but they are not dictating care. Okay. And sometimes you may feel coerced that like, we're just gonna take this one to jail. No, absolutely not. Especially if they had a rope around their neck just a few minutes ago, right? Um, they need to go to a hospital, end of story. So. Yeah, actually we usually have the opposite conflict with law enforcement. They want them to go to the hospital. <laughs> well, I'm saying y'all are the medical providers. It is, it is your assessment that determines this, okay? So the follow up on that, and I'm not sure if this is from the same person or not, both okay. of them were signed in as guests, but can you review CMS guidelines regarding quote not being requirements for an ambulance if the patient is not chemically or physically restrained? And it says per the CMS medical director. I don't know that CMS, I don't know what CMS medical director means. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. I'm not sure I do either. Meaning, can they go BLS? Can they go, they cannot go POV, if that's what that person's asking. Yeah, so in an emergency circumstance, there's always implied need for ambulance transport. Yeah. So you don't have to get, uh, in non-emergencies, a lot of the private ambulance companies deal with getting the, uh, uh, what's it called? The, the certificate sign, certificate of medical necessity signs for our transport. That doesn't exist in emergency calls. Hmm. So, and the and the other thing there is, there's a couple of nuances about what you're talking about. One, if the patient is under arrest by law enforcement, law enforcement, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, has the legal right to direct the patient's medical care. If they're in custody, if they're under arrest, okay. they are responsible legally. Do you guys work together though to make them a three five three? I mean, they take your input. Yeah, I think in most so I cases, know that. that's, that's good for me to true. know. I see a few people shaking their head no. The other part of that is I'm not sure <laughs> we as licensed paramedic have the authority under the current state law and codes to force somebody to transport without online medical orders. Yes. We have to have online medical No, that is true. Phone home. Phone home. But you have that right on scene, right? If you are worried, if you think they need it. Yes, sir, why are you pointing at me? You think that's phone home. Oh, yes, phone home. <laughs> Just phone home. Yeah. yeah, that is true. But I mean, the determination is yours, right? If you feel they need it, call us, right? Yeah. You're on scene. We tend to trust y'all. So the person who asked the question offered clarification by saying center 
medical medical services is actually centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, services is what CMS stands for. But we, we know what that stands for. We just don't know what you're referencing by the CMS medical director. The CMS medical director doesn't have any direct call over any of us that I'm aware of. So still don't understand that question. Sorry. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, thank you. Thank you for the question. I truly appreciate it. Um, okay. So excited delirium, this is a syndrome. This is not a diagnosis, okay? Um, this is not recognized by the DSM, which is the psychiatrist um, diagnosis Bible. Um, there's no ICD code for this, right? So this is a constellation of signs and symptoms. Um, these patients, um, you will know them when you see them. They are extremely agitated, delirious. They have a lot of psychomotor agitation. They're just moving around, they're up, their minds are racing, they're not. Thinking clearly, they have physiologic excitation, they're tachycardic, they're diaphoretic, they're hypertensive, um, increased strength, increased pain tolerance, and they're always naked for some reason. I don't know if they're warm, but they're naked, and they're sweaty, and they're slippery, and they're hard to hold on to. Um, this is associated with drug use, certainly stimulants, bath salts, PCP, um, less so with LSD and alcohol, but absolutely can still be on board and can be associated. Um, these patients are in serious distress, right? They are in extremis um, and they have a high risk for cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, so prioritize chemical restraints and these patients 100% need sedation, whether you're able to, you know, once you get them physically restrained, they need sedation. So there's a video. Let's see if we can get this to work. It may not work. Tim. Oh, oh it may not work. Well, I guess it's not going to work, but the long story of it, you can Google plenty of videos. You guys may have met these patients yourselves, um, but they're not on this planet. They're often grunting. They make animal noise. They're screaming. They're nonsensical. They're very violent. Um, they're exceedingly dangerous, right? So, yeah, it was a good video. I'm sorry you didn't get to see it. Um, but anyway, so we'll talk a little bit about capacity, right? Can my patient refuse transport? Okay. Um, so... To refuse transport, a patient has to have capacity as determined by you, their medical provider. Um, you have to feel comfortable in ruling out organic causes, right? They're not hypoxic, they're not hypoglycemic, they don't have signs of external trauma. Um, they have no evidence of being a danger to themselves or others. There's no aggressive behavior that you're worried about. Um, it is very helpful if there is a known history of psychiatric disorder that is presented similarly, right? Not all people who are psychotic need acute medical care, right? Some people are just psychotic and they're functioning in the world, right? So that can be hard to tell, right? Is this a new problem? Is this worse? Is this their normal behavior? Are they being dangerous? Um, and then it's always nice if there's social, family, or mental health support, right? Like the next best choice. We don't think you need to go to the hospital, but is there some family on scene that can kind of keep an eye on you? Um, you know, they, some patients that have extreme psychiatric illness have caseworkers and, you know, special people from, you know, our social workers that help, um, that help take care of them, right? That we can kind of get in touch with and get them to help us on scene. All right, so capacity, okay? Describes a person's ability to make a decision, okay? Um, this is a fundamental aspect of autonomy, right? We are all autonomous people. You have your own intrinsic rights and to violate those rights, right? To take that away from you is not a small thing. Um, so again, just appropriate weight should be placed on these decisions. Um, and this is different from competence. Competence is determined by a court system, okay? Um, so there's four decision-making abilities that make up capacity, understanding. They have to be able to express what they want their choice to be. They have to appreciate this specific scenario and how it applies to them. Um, and then how is their reasoning, right? Is their reasoning actually reasonable? So this, um, I like, you know, like implied consent, but that's not actually true. You're not just going to like sit there with somebody uh, with a rope around their neck and wait for them to pass out. We're going to intervene before that happens. <laughs> there you go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so if somebody is obviously altered, they don't have, I mean, they just don't have capacity. Yeah. Well, I mean, if they, so. It's tough, right? So do I see, it is, it's hard. So like, do I see patients in the emergency department who are that are intoxicated, right? You're drunk, right? You're clinically drunk. Um, and sometimes 
I will let them go when they are clinically sober, right? They can walk, they can drink and eat, they're protecting their airway. I've sat on them for an appropriate amount of time, especially if they have a family member or somebody responsible that I feel I can trust that's gonna keep an eye on them. So that's a gray area. That's a good question, right? If someone's fall down drunk and there's no way home, like done, that's easy, right? So the extremes of situations are always the easy ones. It's all that gray area in between. So it's hard. We can't, you know, go over every possible scenario, right? Um, but you just have to use your better judgment, right? Do we have, you know, how intoxicated are they, right? Why did you get called, right? Did you get called because they were trying to hurt themselves or did they just like, they're just drunk in public and they fell down and, you know, oh, here comes family or friends down the street and they're going to help them. And, right, so every scenario is really unique. It's really hard to answer. But anything that impairs their decision making needs to be taken very seriously. And that includes all types of intoxication. The, the real tricky part there is they're allowed to be bad decision makers and still retain capacity. That is true, right? So it's, they, they can be reasonable with respect to the way they reason, not the, with respect to the way we reason. I agree with that. The, you, it, those situations are tricky and you just have to use your, your better judgment. Take all information you have on, you know, in that moment and do whatever you think is the safest. But I would always suggest that we err on the side of caution, right? If there's any concern, if there's gray area, go home, right? Yeah. E.T., yeah. go I'm home. Right people, uh, the joke is people have a right to be stupid. Mm. I've had people with sure. horrific injuries that they need to get treatment or they're going to lose a limb or yeah. an eye or other important appendages and they have more treatment. And if they recognize that fact, then they have a right yeah. to make that decision. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, but if you have a concern, if you're uncomfortable, call med control. Get that doctor to talk to them, give them the name on the chart to back you up. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Okay, so this is a little bit about each um, category, the definition, and some sample questions. So understanding, um, you know, people can, you know, it's the ability to state the meaning of the relevant information. Like, what is your diagnosis? What do you understand about your medical condition? What can you tell me about why I'm here? talking to you today? Like, what's the situation we find ourselves in? What does your patient understand? Expressing a choice. Can they even tell you what they want, right? You want to go? You want to stay? You want some medicine? You don't want some medicine? You know, that's suspect if they can't even, like, get it together enough to, to communicate their preference. Um, appreciation. So the ability to explain how the information applies to them, right? Um, so like I had a patient who was a poly sub user and had just disgusting, horrible um, bilateral or extremity wounds. He met sepsis criteria. They were wrapped in disgusting plastic bags for some reason. I wanted him to stay for IV antibiotics. Um, he initially said yes. And then he was like, no, I need to leave. And I was like, hey, uh, you know, you could die, right? Like, and I kind of talked to him about everything and then, um, you know, asked him to repeat those things back to me. Like, if I let you leave, what can happen to you, right? And he's like, I could die. Okay, you were listening. All right. I mean, that shows that you appreciate the situation. Um, and then reasoning, right? The ability to compare information and infer consequences of choices, right? How is X better than Y? What happens if this happens? What happens if we do this, right? Um, these are not easy things, right? These are not easy things to do, especially, you know, in the pre-hospital environment, on scene, with patients that are kind of difficult to talk to sometimes. So what you are tasked with is not easy, right? So I appreciate that y'all um, care about these things and put an appropriate weight on them. Okay, so just a little quickie about protocols. There is no psychiatric or behavioral emergency protocol, right? So we use altered mental status. This really is just making sure we're getting, checking the blood sugar, we're getting an EKG if we think it's indicated, we're getting um, a full set of vital signs, right? And then of course, um, you know, whatever, if you find something going down that appropriate protocol pathway, but also just being flexible on how things unfold, right? Um, okay, common mistakes, pitfalls, missing an underlying organic cause. Um, we talked about, we kind of hammering this home, um, but these situations, they can be chaotic. Treatment mistakes can happen. I drew up the wrong medicine. I drew up the wrong dose of medicine. I, you know, I missed something because people were running around. It was dangerous or because, or maybe just because I was like, ah, this person, I run on this person all the time. This is just like, it's just psych. It's just psych. It's always psych. Sometimes it's not, you know, um, not taking a behavioral issue seriously. So erring on the side of transport and treatment if you're unsure. Just like we were saying, this, there's so much gray area here. 
everything is unique. If you are in doubt, we are always happy to help and discuss it with you to see what, you know, we all think the safest thing for this patient is. Um, and then not prioritizing your safety, um, using only force with an agitated patient, right? Please always attempt verbal de-escalation. Sometimes you're out, you know, sometimes you're having a bad day and you're, it's hard to force yourself to do it. You're frustrated. This is a patient you know well and is very rude, but you owe it to them to always try. Um, and then police are not medical providers. They do not dictate medical care, apparently, unless they're arrested. And then they do, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, but I would, if you have a concern, I would encourage you to advocate for your patient, right? Even if it's not up to you and you're worried about something, most of the cops are pretty good. You know, just talk to them. Just tell them what you're worried about, what you think needs to happen. Um, and then if restraints of any kind are used, this patient will, should never be left alone. Um, and they need frequent reassessment during on scene and during transport. Okay, big picture stuff. This is a broad range of possible scenarios, right? Um, unique challenges for y'all and for management of the patient. Um, specific skills are very helpful with these folks. These skills can be learned, they can be practiced, and with proper application can help you, can help the patient on scene. Um, Restraints are dangerous. They have the potential for danger, so take that seriously, right? Uh, it is not a small thing to take away someone's rights. Um, and these calls can be frustrating, emotionally exhausting. There's a lot of stigma um, that can potentially lead to bias and suboptimal care. So just checking in with yourself about how you're feeling, you know, how you're feeling about this patient. Um, and following your protocols and when in doubt, call medical control. We're always here. These are tough, tough scenarios sometimes, okay? Um, and then I do have a couple cases. It's already past 11. You guys want to run through them? Do we have time, Wes? Do it? Okay, they're, they're brief. They're mostly about like, can they be left on scene? Do they need to be transported? That's mostly what this is. Okay, 19-year-old male, severe autism. Mom called because he's agitated, being violent at home. Okay, you get on scene. Mom's outside with police. The patient, you can see him through the window. He's yelling and kind of just like throwing pillows around. He looks, he's a big kid. Um, and he looks very severely autistic, right? Um, so what do you want to do? I can answer whatever questions you may have, and I can give you whatever information you may want. Um, yeah. All right. So you're trying to talk to the patient. Okay. I think that's that's a good first step, right? Let's let's start talking. Let's try to verbally de-escalate this situation, right? Let's get mom's help. So. Um, you are able to talk to him, right? I think that's exactly what I wanted someone to say. So you were able to talk to him, you talked to mom. Um, it sounds like this is not a typical behavior for this child. He gets upset almost every day. Mom's just usually able to control it for whatever reason, he's just kind of on a roll today. Um, but using his favorite stuffed animal and some things that tricks mom knows, you all were able to work together without police, um, um, without police or any kind of hands-on stuff. And now he's sitting outside on the porch and you're able to get what else do we want to get? Now that he'll let you touch him. Wow. Let's get a set of vitals. All right, here's your set of vitals. You can't get a blood sugar, um, and mom begs you not to poke him with anything because we just got him calm, right? So please. Um, but she says he has no history of diabetes. He had breakfast. He had lunch. She's been drinking Gatorade all day. And up until this happened, which is not unusual for him, um, he was in his usual state of health. I'm okay with that blood sugar in that, in that scenario. I know I'm like, always get a blood sugar. But in this scenario, I think this is a little bit of an exception where there's no real, you don't really have a concern, right? The kid calms down. He's not diaphoretic. He doesn't, you know, he's not altered um, from his usual behavior. Okay, so after it seems like forever, you did an excellent job. You're able to calm the patient. Um, mom says, again, not uncommon behavior. He's got really worked up. She called dad. Um, so this kid's a lot bigger than mom, but she called dad. Um, who's going to come home from work? She really does not want him to have to go to the hospital. What do we think? One question that didn't get asked, yeah. does he take his medicine? Yes, you know? mom said he's adherent to his medicine. He's usually really good about it. She did give it to him today. Um, and now she says, you know, he's he's totally back to normal. So the big question here is who, if anyone, has control over the decision-making for the patient because the patient's a 19-year-old adult? Yeah, he is an adult. That's very true. Um, you know, well, let's say there is legal, there is like legal, they have medical decision making ability for the patient. The mother does. Excellent question. I'm sure I'm just going to control it. Maybe wait for dad to get home. Yeah, you can do that. Dad's on his way. She'd be home in just a few minutes. Make sure that everyone, he's also in agreement with this. But do, would y'all feel comfortable here letting this kid stay? 
I would too. I think I would too. I think this is, you know, you have, um, you know, you, you've been able to verbally deescalate. Mom says this is his typical behavior. This is not uncommon. He just got like she just couldn't calm him down for a few minutes, but now he's totally back to normal. She feels comfortable. There's no real vital sign abnormalities. She's adamant, you know, that he couldn't have gotten any drugs or substances. He doesn't do that, right? And they're very reasonable. Call us back if something happens. We're happy to come back and reassess, okay? So I agree with you. I think this patient can stay home. Good job. All right, case number two. 23-year-old female, past medical history, or without past medical history, excuse me. Um, she's been drinking at a friend's house, locked herself in the bathroom, said she's going to cut her wrist. Bummer. Um, so on scene, police have already gotten her out of the bathroom. Um, she's sobbing. She's got makeup all over her face, and she's kind of nonsensically talking about an ex-boyfriend and, um, you know, how much she loves him, and they, he broke her heart. Okay, what do y'all want to do here? Questions? You want anything? Want to get anything, obtain anything? Yeah, exactly. So we'll start kind of going down kind of the SI stuff, right? Like, you know, you know, what's going on? How, you know, how long have you been feeling this way? Have you ever tried to hurt yourself before? We're looking at her skin. There's no cut marks on her skin. She's not cut or anything like that. Um, she, you know, she has a job. She's a, you know, normal. She goes to school. She's kind of a normal person. Her friends are the one that called. They're there with her. Um, but she is like, kind of nonsensical, very clearly drunk. Okay, so you got a set of vitals because she's sitting on the couch with you. Um, you know, everything looks fine. She's a little tacky card, but she's a little upset. You know, everything else is okay. Um, what other questions? What else y'all want to know at this point? Has she broken any laws that the police are willing to enforce? Nope. Cops are not taking her to jail. She's not under arrest. Yep. Excellent question. She denies it and she just looks intoxicated. Her friends corroborate that story. You don't see any drug paraphernalia or anything around. And they look like semi reasonable young adults. Okay. All right. At this point, um, you're like, well, you know, I'm still kind of worried about you. You said you're going to kill yourself. You actually locked yourself in a room. You're clearly intoxicated. She's refusing. She's like, I didn't mean it. I was just joking. It was a joke. My friends just, you know, they didn't know it was a joke. Are her friends drunk too? Her friends have been drinking. Excellent. Because I was going to say, like, well, she's got friends with her. I was going to try to trick you guys. Um, she's got friends with her. They said they, you know, they'll watch her. You know, she's reasonable. She's never done this before. But her friends have been drinking. So what are we going to do for this lady? She's going. Yeah. Good job. She's going. Awesome. Okay. Case number three. Last one. Um, so a 54-year-old homeless male, history of poly substance abuse. You know this gentleman. Um, he's not very nice. Um, police, um, you know, were called because he was harassing bystanders downtown somewhere. Um, he's obviously intoxicated. They called you, though, because he just, I don't know, some, he just seems like a little more intoxicated than normal, we'll say. Um, disheveled, dirty, slurred speech, a tax at gate. But it's like he's, he's drunk every time you see this guy. But he's got scattered bruising, dried blood. He's wearing 18 layers of clothing, despite it being 105 degrees out for some reason. Um, but what you can see, he's he's dirty, but he looks a little like bumped up, bruised up. Okay. What about this guy? What do you want? Yeah. It is hard with this guy though. He knows you, right? You guys run at him all the time, and so he's like immediately gets a little pissy pants when he sees you. But that's the right thing to do, right? You're like, all right, Bill, what's going on today? What happened? Okay. Um, he will let you get a set of vitals, okay? He's kind of a jerk about it, but, right, you had, um, you can give him a bag of chips or something, let you do it. Um, so here's his set of vitals, okay? He's intoxicated, not in acute withdrawal, a little hypertensive, but everything, you know, eh, not too bad, okay? All right, so trying to get history, trying to get history. Uh, he's become a little more agitated, a little more agitated. You know, is it just because he doesn't like you? He's a mean old codger, right? Okay. So what do you get? What do you think? What else do we want to do, right? I know it's it really kind of sucks, but more, more thorough physical exam. Yes, exactly. It's covered in clothes, but you see some like bumps and bruises. You know what I mean? He looks like well, maybe he's falling. I don't know. Excellent. Okay. So you're trying to get him to kind of let you examine him. He vomits. Okay, now what? Right? You guys are really good. I'm really impressed. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, this guy fell, right? Or somebody beat the heck out of him because he's a jerk, right? So he, we're concerned that he's bleeding into his brain, maybe. So he's not going to stay on the scene, right? Awesome job, you guys. Impressive. All right. Thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with me. Um, questions? That is my email. Um, I appreciate y'all putting up with me and listening to me and letting us be here. So if I can do anything, y'all have clinical questions, you just want to chit chat, you want to say hi, please don't hesitate to reach out, okay? Yeah. Thank y'all. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Excellent. That's awesome. Uh, very good session. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, um, Dr. Melissa, and uh, thanks, Dr. Davis, for your lecture as well. So, uh, we're going to be in Mobile on uh, August 24th. Uh, we'll be at the Mobile Convention Center here today. If you're in the area and, and listening online, we're going to go break for lunch here briefly, and, and we're going to do a skills lab uh, down in the area of Trustful Fire Department's admin that they usually use for CPAP. Uh, if you're familiar with that, a lot of people in the area are. And uh, please come and join us. We'd love to have you for the skills lab. We've got uh, several positions here and uh, we'll be doing some cool stuff. And if you're in the Mobile area on the 24th, please join us. Remember, you can always join online. Please remember to fill out an attendance form. The link is in the chat. You can also send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated response with a link to the attendance form. The password for today's form is trustful, all lowercase trustful and even if you don't need the con ed or, or any of that it really helps us to, to be able to track your attendance and gives us an opportunity to get your feedback uh, which we do read and we take action on uh, to try to make the program better so thanks everybody for participating and that person Lastly, uh, if you look on eventbrite the cadaver lab for august is posted it's the 24th 26th and 25th um, so if you can go to Mobile with us, go to Mobile. If you're in town, we've got a cadaver lab with Dr. Evans that we say. And then Thursday and Friday is the EMS portion as well. But it's on Eventbrite. You can find it on Facebook. It's posted as of yesterday. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks, everybody, for participating, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>